Hi everybody, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on which part of the world you currently are. Uh, welcome to Data Platform Summit from my side. I'm extremely happy to be part of this event, so first of all, big thanks goes to Amit and his team for giving me a chance uh, to be part of such a great conference. Uh, today we will dive deep into different challenges related to a Power BI performance. Uh, I'll show you what are the deadly sins when it comes to performance and how to avoid taking this road to hell. Before we start, let me just briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Nikola Ilic. I'm originally from Belgrade in Serbia, but since last uh, five years I live in the wonderful city of Salzburg in Austria, where I work as a business intelligence developer at company ITSP Services. Uh, living in Salzburg was the reason why I've chosen my nickname Data Mozart. I guess you all know that Salzburg is worldly famous as the birthplace of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, so I was brave enough to use his last name as part of my nickname. And that's why my motto is make music from your data. Uh, you can find me on the web, I'm regularly blogging at data-mozart.com. I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn and Twitter, so feel free to ping me or connect if you like. A few more sentences about me. Uh, I have multiple year experience working with different data products. Started with SQL Server, then brushed myself uh, with analysis services, multidimensional, SQL Server integration services, reporting services, and most recently, if you consider last almost four years as recent with Power BI, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, I'm also a Microsoft Data Platform MVP and Microsoft Certified Trainer. Privately, I'm father of two little kids and true football and Barca fan, as you can conclude looking at the photo on your screens. Let me be honest with you, uh, creating a Power BI report may look like an easy task. Okay, so you import the data, set those nice colorful visuals and your shiny dashboard is ready. However, one day you receive a phone call from the report user who complains that the Power BI report is slow. Or even worse, your TBA walks into your office and asks you to explain why your report burns all the available resources during the data refresh process. Or no one comes to you, but your report blows the maximum limit in terms of memory consumption. As I've already told you, creating a Power BI report is not a rocket science, but there is a huge difference between a Power BI report that just works and Power BI report that works efficiently. Now you're probably asking yourselves, if I have performance, performance issues, where do I start? And that's a great question. Once you identify the area that causes problems, you are halfway through the solution. Okay, maybe not halfway, but you can then shift your focus to finding a solution to a more specific issue. That being said, there are at least five key areas to examine if you want to improve the performance of your Power BI report. So what are those areas? First one is the data model size. Next, data refresh process. Straight after that, DAX calculations. Then visualization rendering time and finally storage mode choice. So let's go and try to understand each of these areas in more depth. And I will show you some potential caveats and how you can avoid or overcome them. I will also share with you some best practices for getting the maximum performance uh, from your Power BI report in multiple different scenarios. Okay, so the first thing I would like to discuss is your data model size. It's so important that in certain scenarios uh, for example, where you, are, where you are operating on Power BI Pro license, which has a one gigabyte limit per data set, your solution simply can't be used if you reach that limit. Uh, data model size also affects our second talking point, data refresh process. As you may assume, the larger the model, the more time and resources needed for the data refresh. Uh, <clears throat> essentially, tabular model speed is based on keeping data in memory. Thus, the smaller the memory footprint, footprint of your data model, the faster it will be. Now to understand what affects your data model size, we need to lay some theoretical background. Uh, first of all, when you choose import mode for your data in Power BI, data is being stored in a columnar database called VertiPack. Uh, VertiPack keeps the snapshot of your data in memory. That's why, it's so, why it is so, so fast. 
and this snapshot can be refreshed periodically from the original data source. In order to understand how things work in the background, uh, you should be able to distinguish between Formula Engine and Storage Engine, two key components of this underlying architecture. Uh, Formula Engine represents the brain of Power BI. It translates DAX to a specific query plan, and that query plan consists of different physical operations such as joins, uh, filtering conditions, segregations, and so on. On the other hand, Storage Engine represents the muscles of Power BI, as it literally physically goes through the data stored in the tabular model. So if Storage Engine needs to dig through massive amounts of data, it would obviously need more time and resources. I will give you an analogy. Imagine that you have to find a book in your old attic. Uh, what do you think? Would it be faster and easier to find it if you have just a few items around or if the attic is in mass and full of all kinds of stuff? I guess you all know the answer. Uh, so optimizing data model size is a is extremely wide topic that I have a separate session dedicated to it exclusively. So let me just here list best practices related to data model size optimization. First one, uh, reduce the amount of data you are importing in your data model and keep only those rows and columns your users really need in the report. That means remove uh, not just unnecessary columns, but also unnecessary rows. In reality, if you don't need the data from, let's say, last five years, but only two, then simply don't import all the data. Uh, try to reduce column cardinality whenever possible. Uh, in most cases, Vertipack needs to use hash encoding algorithm to build a dictionary for values uh, in the column. Uh, the lower the cardinality, the smaller the dictionary and consequentially it takes less memory. So if you don't need data, uh, for example, on a level of granularity lower than a day, then remove time portion of the data and that will significantly reduce uh, the size of that column. I will show you in a few minutes in one example what I'm talking about. Next, avoid using calculated columns whenever possible as they are simply said they are not optimally compressed. Instead, if you need to do some calculations, uh, try to push them uh, to a data source like SQL database, for example, or perform them using Power Query Editor. Uh, disable auto daytime option for data loading as this will remove a bunch of automatically created hidden date tables in the background. Instead, always create a proper date or calendar dimension in your data model. Okay, so let me show you one of these points in action. Um, it's time to switch to Power BI Desktop and uh, see how this works in the background. So here I have a date time date team start UTC column that goes to the second level of precision, second level of granularity. In 95% of cases, I would say you won't need granularity lower than a day. Maybe in some scenarios you would need hour level, but let's stick with the majority of cases where you will need day level as the lowest point of granularity. So if I close this one and let me show you. So this. Uh, original column has cardinality of 9 million rows, so we have 9 million distinct values. And if I open DAX Studio from external tools and go to DAX Studio, by the way, uh, DAX Studio is a fantastic free tool. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, you should definitely start using it. it it's free and it has a, a bunch of awesome features that will uh, significantly improve your Power BI development, so go and grab DAX Studio if you're not using it already. Uh, so if we go to Advanced tab, one of the uh, one of the best features in the, uh, DAX Studio is VertiPack Analyzer tool. Uh, if you click on Advanced tab and open View Metrics, that will help me to understand some uh, metrics behind my data model. So I will see all tables for my data model. I can see the size of the table. Uh, just to be clear, all those numbers are in bytes. So you can see that my chats table occupies like uh, something more than half of gig, so 554 megabytes. You can see how, mu how much goes to data size and dictionary size, and you can see uh, how much in terms of percentage this table occupies within the whole data model. 
And now if I click on this small arrow here next to table name, I can expand uh, the table and see all those numbers broken down on column level. So I can immediately see that my day team start column has cardinality of almost 9 million as, as we saw in Power BI Desktop. And the size of this column is 454 megabytes. Let me do, let me zoom it a little bit because this number is important. We need to remember this number. So 454 megabytes. Okay. Uh, now I'll go back to my Power BI desktop and uh, let's go to Power Query Editor and remove this time portion of the data because we don't need it for, as I said, 95% of scenarios. So I will just change type of this column from date time to date. And you will see that time portion disappeared. I'll hit close and apply and let's wait for a few seconds for Power BI to apply those changes uh, on our data model. Okay, it's almost done. So we have around 9.2 million rows in this fact table. That should be it. And once it's loaded, this number here uh, should change and we will see a different value for uh, distinct values in the daytime column. And it's instead of almost 9 million, it's now 1356. Let's go again to DAX Studio and I will refresh this view metrics. And now you can see that if expand chats table, now day team start UTC uh, column occupies only six megabytes. So instead of having 454 megabytes, now we have six megabytes just by removing this time portion here. So as I said, try to reduce the cardinality of your columns whenever you can, as that will enable VertiPack uh, to compress the data more efficiently. Fine, now that you know how to optimize your data model size, your data refresh process will run much faster. Well, that's true, but not in 100% of cases. I mean, if that was simple as that, this session wouldn't have existed in the first place. As I've already explained, uh, VertiPack keeps the snapshot of your data in memory, and you are then refreshing this snapshot from time to time depending on your specific business needs. It can be once per hour, once per day, and so on. Now, chances are that you're applying some transformations to your data before you load it to Power BI, be it currency conversion, data filtering, uh, renaming your columns, performing some calculations, and so on. So, where do you shape your data? Uh, source database, that's the most obvious choice and in most cases the most desirable scenario based on traditional uh, extract, transform, load or uh, abbreviated ETL processes. If you don't perform data transformations on the source side, the next station is Power Query. What is Power Query? Shortly said, it's the built-in tool within Power BI that enables you to perform all kinds of transformations to your data. Uh, last time I checked, and according to Microsoft's uh, official documentation, you can apply more than 300 different transformations and that number is constantly increasing. Uh, the key advantage of Power Query is that you can perform all those transformations with little or no coding, no coding skills at all. Additionally, all steps you applied uh, during the data transformation process are being saved. So every time you go back and refresh your data set, uh, those steps will be automatically applied to shape your data and prepare it for consuming uh, via reports. Under the hood of Power Query is a mashup engine that enables your data shaping process uh, running smoothly. Power Query uses very powerful M language for data manipulation. Now for some data sources such as relational databases but also non-relational data sources, for example OData or Active Directory or Exchange, Mashup Engine is able to translate M language to a language that this underlying data source will understand. In most cases, of course, it's equal. And by pushing complex calculations and transformations directly to a source, uh, Power Query leverages capabilities of uh, those robust relational database management systems and their engines that are built to cope with large volumes of data in the most efficient way. That ability of Power Query is 
mashup engine to create one single SQL statement combining all M statements behind your transformations is what we call query folding or let's make it simple. If the mashup engine is able to generate a single SQL query that is going to be executed on the data source side, we say that the query folds. Uh, query folding is an extremely important feature in Power BI and as such also deserves a separate session to get familiar with all the capabilities and limitations. However, I want to show you today how this feature may increase or decrease efficiency of your data refresh process. So once again, we will switch to Power BI Desktop and I will show you query folding demo. I prepared a data model that contains only one table which has around 12.6 million rows. And now I will open Power Query Editor and apply some transformations to my data. So first of all, let's say that I want to expand the customer table and grab some columns from there like first name, last name and gender. Then I will do a transformation on first name and I want to uppercase all the values within this column. Let's wait for a few seconds for this to be applied. Fine. Then I will go and get rid of time portion here. So I will change type of uh, my column from date time to date. So you will see that this time portion will disappear from here. Then I will go to sales amount column and let's say that I want to calculate absolute value of this column then i will go to total cost and let's say that i want to filter out rows so i want to keep only those rows where uh, total cost is greater than five okay then i will go and remove etl load id column completely then after that i will do one replacement Let's say that for gender column, I want to replace value and instead of M, I want to uh, use male. And finally, let's go and keep only uh, within sales amount column, only big orders. So let's say where sales amount is greater than 300. Okay. And now if I right click on this last step here in transformation window, let's wait for a few more seconds, you will see that this view native query option is enabled, so I can click on it. And if I click on this option, let me expand this window, you will see that this is a nice SQL, maybe not nice, but it's correct SQL. So keep in mind that uh, Meshup Engine will generate correct SQL. If you're coming from SQL world, maybe you will find this query like, you know, not the most efficient one, not the most optimal one, but that's what we are getting automatically generated by uh, Meshup Engine. So you can see here, for example, our filter, which was translated to a where close. You can see also this one, total cost greater than five. You can see uh, some other transformations here like uppercase, uh, converting to date, absolute value and uh, using replace t sql function to replace m with mail. So in this case, uh, Meshup Engine was able to, uh, to uh, translate our uh, transformations to a sql. Let's apply those transformations and I will hit close and apply and measure the performance of the data refresh. So we'll see that this data refresh process should take maybe around 20, 30 seconds. You see that batches of rows that are being imported like it's one 100,000, 120,000 per batch. Just remember this because in the next example, I will show you the difference in the data refresh process. So now it's, it's like 100,000 rows per batch. And this is basically it. So around 20, 30 seconds for the whole process. And we have 2.8 million rows that satisfy our criteria. 
Now I will open again Power Query Editor and I will intentionally break the query folding. So here uh, I will remove this step. Again, I will remove time portion from this column. So now instead of changing type, I will use transform here and date only. Yes, I will confirm that I want to insert this step. And you'll see that in the end, the result is the same. So we got rid of time portion here. There are no hours, minutes and seconds anymore. And all the other transformations remain the same. So everything stays exactly the same. But this time, if I right click here on the last step, you will see that this view native query option is disabled, which means that there is no query following. And let's see what are the implications for data refresh process. I will again hit close and apply and let's wait for Power BI to apply our changes. Now the first thing you can spot is that now the batches of rows are way smaller than in the previous case. Now Power BI imports like 30, 40,000 maximum, 30, around 30,000 per batch. That's the first indicator that your query folding is broken. So if you spot that Power BI slowly loads data or in smaller batches, you should go and investigate your transformation steps uh, to see if the query folding is in place or not. So we need to wait like, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 seconds more. And we are almost there. Oops, so what happened here? Why did Power BI uh, continue loading data even, even the, uh, though we know that we have 2.8 million records that satisfy our criteria? Well, what happened here is that Mashup Engine has to pull all the data from the data source and then apply transformations uh, that we defined on top of all these rows. So in the end, it, it is around 11, 12 million rows. So when you don't have query folding in place, uh, your data refresh process becomes inefficient. Why? Because Mashup Engine needs to pull all the data and then apply your transformations on top of this data. And as you may uh, notice and as you witness, that has a huge impact on the performance, both in terms of speed uh, and uh, both in terms of time needed for data refresh process and resources uh, consumption. And as I said, we have 11 million rows. Some of the rows were filtered before query folding was broken. In the end, we have again 2.8 million rows. So Mashup Engine needed to pull 11 million rows to be able to process it and uh, display our 2.8 million rows in the table. Okay, so uh, listing all the best practices related to data refresh process would be a complex task. Uh, therefore, if you identify uh, that your data refresh takes, you know, eternity to execute, maybe it's a good idea to check it and investigate in more details. Uh, the first thing I'm going to recommend here is fantastic blog post by Phil Simark, where he explained how you can visualize data refresh process and quickly identify potential bottlenecks. Here is the link to this blog post. Uh, some general best practices in order to speed up data refresh process in general and keep query folding in place would be uh, first and most important one, push calculations and transformations as close to a data source as possible. For example, if you have permission to create a database objects, you can encapsulate all the necessary transformations in the database view and then import that view in Power BI. Uh, views, same as tables are foldable object by default. Uh, then again, uh, query folding is not all or nothing operation. That means if you have, let's say, 10 transformation steps and your query folds until sixth step, you will still get some benefit from partial query folding. However, once the query folding is broken, uh, it can't be achieved anymore. So keep that in mind and try to push all non-foldable steps down the transformation pipeline as much as possible. Uh, this one is also important. Turn off 
allow data preview to download in the background. So how do you do this? Uh, I'll go to Power BI Desktop and if we go to File, Options and Settings, Options. And if we go to Current File, Data Load, you see this option, Allow Data Previews to Download in the Background. Uncheck this. So, uh, when you hit the refresh, it's not... So, when you, when you do uh, your transformations in Power Query Editor, you will see preview of the data for every transformation step you applied. So when you hit the refresh, it's not only the amount of data that, that, that gets loaded into your data set, but also a whole bunch of different queries to refresh this preview. And in some situations, these queries take more time than loading data itself. Uh, one important disclaimer here for this one last option that I've just shown you. Uh, this is happening only in Power BI Desktop, not in Power BI Service. Keep that in mind. Finally, if I have to choose one single rule regarding data refresh process, and let me call it a golden rule, that would be data should be transformed as far upstream as possible and as far downstream as necessary. It's not my sense, sentence. I picked that from Matthew Roche from Microsoft's uh, Power BI customer advisory team. And... Uh, Keep that sentence always on your mind. Now hopefully we are done with the background scenes and we are slowly uh, navigating to a user interface. Honestly, that is the area of Power BI where performance uh, issues are easiest to spot. And I'm sure that sooner rather than later someone will come to you and say, hey, why is my report so slow? Of course, there can be a whole bunch of potential reasons, but let's focus on a few that are most often guilty for the bad user experience uh, caused by slowness. So once you import data in Power BI, I assume you will start writing DAX measures to satisfy business, uh, different business requests. For example, you need to provide business decision makers with uh, the metrics such as the number of unique customers, uh, top performing products, uh, running totals of the sales amount and so on. The beauty of DAX, and I intentionally put this be word beauty under the quotes, so the beauty of DAX is that you can achieve the same result in multiple different ways. I will not definitely not go deep into DAX logic in this session. There are many other fantastic sessions on Data Platform Summit that you should attend to learn DAX in more depth. However, there are few certain situations where little nuances in your DAX formulas can take you in a direction that you wish to avoid. Therefore, it's demo time, so let me show you one basic example of how misusing DAX calculations can cause a significant performance decrease in your Power BI report. So here I'm in my Power BI desktop, and this is a simple visual that shows total number of orders uh, higher than with sales amount higher than 300. Uh, don't forget then in one of the previous demos we filtered our table so we now have only those orders where sales amount is greater than 300. And this is uh, the calculation for uh, this measure which is broken down on a day level. So now let's go to DAX Studio and I will show you how this measure can be written in a bad way. So I will run this portion of query here and let's wait for a few seconds and uh, see what happened in the background. So this query should be soon finished hopefully and then we will compare results. Uh, we will first compare the, the numbers Remember, performance is important, but it is even more important to have correct figures in the end. So you see that this query took 46 seconds to execute, 46 seconds. And if I go to results and sort my numbers, you will see that for 1st of January, it's 1627, 1870, etc, etc. So if we go back to Parway Desktop, you will see that those number matches between the cells, so we get correct results. But what's wrong with that, with this measure? Uh, this measure returned, as I said, correct results, but why is it so slow? So again, if I go back to DAX Studio 
and take a look at server timings. So it took 46 seconds. And uh, if we take a deeper look into those queries, uh, we will see that each of those queries took around 30, between 30 and 40 milliseconds to execute. So that, that was quite fast. But the problem is there were 1097 of them, 1097 queries. Basically what Formula Engine did here for every materialized table of data returned by Storage Engine, it ran a distinct count against each set of data specified in our filter condition date by date. So one query was ran for each date. Now, I guess you assume that there has to be a more optimal way to obtain these same results. So let's go and rewrite our measure. This time I will execute this measure. Again, hit clear cache and run. And this should return results in 200 milliseconds. This time we have only one single query that was generated and in 200 milliseconds basically. So what, what's the difference here? If you take a look, if you take a deeper look here, we, we are filtering a table. So we are filtering whole online sales table and then we are providing, we want only sales amount, uh, where sales amount is greater than 300. In other case, we are filtering only sales amount columns. So we are keeping filter only on this column. So we are not filtering the whole table. And then the, 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 the condition is exactly the same. So basically if I take a look here at results and sort, you will see that the numbers are again the same. Uh, I could also write this measure in a third way using so-called syntax sugar variation. This time if I run this, again I'm getting the same results. If I take a look at server timings, again 204 milliseconds, one storage engine query. This is just a syntax sugar. Basically, when you execute this uh, calculation, this will be internally translated to uh, to this. So even if you don't write filter all, uh, Formula Engine will implicitly uh, wrap your uh, statement with with this with filter and all. Okay, now you remember when I told you that the beauty of DAX is that the possibility to obtain same results in multiple different ways. So I want to show you now the fourth measure definition that will return the same results. This time I will use keep filters function. Just one disclaimer, this function is quite different from the filter function that we, are, that we were using so far. But in our scenario, it should return the same result as the previous measure. So I will go and show you this example with keep filters function. So basically this part stays the same in all of the previous as in the previous uh, situations. This time we are just keeping filters on our sales amount column and keeping only those uh, when when uh, rows where sales amount is greater than 300. If I execute this query it should also run fast hopefully yeah again 200 milliseconds and one storage query uh, uh, one uh, storage engine query so basically the same as in the previous cases. If you take a look at results, they're exactly the same. So as you witnessed, we could have written our DAX measure to get the same results in at least four different ways. And this was just a basic example, so simple. But you could have seen the possible implications to performance. Key takeaway from this scene is if you need to filter data, don't filter tables, filter columns instead. Well, this one is the most obvious scene. Uh, when your report page renders slow, you can bet that the report consumers will complain about the poor experience and ask you to do something. So let's check what can be a root cause of the slow rendering. Uh, first of all, Power BI Desktop offers quite handy built-in feature called Performance Analyzer. Uh, performance Analyzer uh, enables you to capture performance metrics for every single visual on the report page. The rule of thumb is the more visuals you have on your report page, the longer time would be needed uh, to render the page. Uh, and I will show you in a few minutes how this looks in reality. So again, it's demo time and let's jump over to Power BI Desktop. Okay, so first thing, let's go to View tab and let's turn on Performance Analyzer. Okay, I will start recording. 
Uh, now, to have completely correct results and exclude the data about the visuals that Power BI already loaded into a memory, we should create a blank page, save our PBIX file with that blank page as the one uh, that is displayed once the report is opened and then reopen the file to kick off from this blank page. However, I will not waste my time on this now as the results I assume will be quite close even if I just stop and start performance analyzer again. Uh, that being said, there are different metrics that performance analyzer captures. So if I go and click on refresh visuals, uh, you will see that for each visual we have total rendering time. I will go and click on this small arrow here and sort my results. So you can sort by different uh, items here. I will sort by total time and I want to sort in descending order. So I can immediately spot uh, what is the slowest visual on my uh, on my report page. Now if I click on this small plus sign here, uh, I can see that DAX query took only 3 milliseconds to execute. Visual display is also some yeah, trivial, trivial figure of 16 milliseconds, but then we have this other, which is 812 milliseconds, so almost 95% of the whole time needed for this card visual to be rendered. Now you're probably asking yourself what the heck this other means. This is a great question, so let me answer it. Other means how long did specific visual had to wait for other actions to complete before it could be handled. So don't forget that formula engine works in a single threaded way, so it can't generate the DAX query for multiple visuals in parallel. Okay, so just remember this figure 831 milliseconds that's the slowest visual on our report page. I will clear this and stop my performance analyzer uh, for a moment. And I want to show you now in this example how you can improve the performance of the report rendering time without violating the original report look. Uh, the original idea came, came from Chris Hamill from Microsoft and his blog post. So here I had two, uh, I had 10 card visuals showing different uh, figures, different metrics from my fact table. And now if I go here to my other page, I have exactly the same look and feel of the report. This time, instead of using 10 card visuals, I'm using two matrix visuals. So matrix visual with spending some time and effort to do a proper formatting, I got exactly the same uh, visual uh, look as in the previous case. Now, if we click again on start recording and refresh my visuals, you can see that the slowest uh, element on my report page was the upper matrix, which took 245 milliseconds to render. In previous case, we had like 850, now we had 250. So it's like almost four times faster than in the previous scenario. If I click again on refresh visuals, it's yeah slightly more, but uh, in the end, uh, this is much more efficient uh, solution than the previous one. So basically, instead of generating 10 separate queries, Formula Engine now was able to generate only two queries, two separate queries to retrieve all the data. And that obviously reduced rendering time for our report. Uh, similar outcome for this specific scenario can be achieved also using a free custom visual card with states from OKVs, uh, which you can download uh, from the App Source Marketplace. When it comes to the best practices uh, regarding visual rendering time, here is the list of things you should do or not do when it comes to, to performance of your visuals. First thing, reduce the number of visuals on your report page. Uh, if you don't need a visual, simply remove it from the page. Also, having multiple non-data related objects such as uh, shapes or text boxes will also impact the rendering time. Therefore, if you plan to have a lot of shapes and text boxes and icons, images, consider using PowerPoint. There, you can create your desirable page design with all the shapes, all the text boxes, icons, images, save this, uh, save this uh, page design as an image and then set this image as a page background in Power BI. That way you will have only one page element instead of multiple uh, 
uh, elements. Uh, reducing the number of visuals on your report page also means that, like in our example, if you have a possibility to satisfy the business request by generating one DAX query instead of five or ten, you should tend to do it whenever possible. Try to display data at high level of grain. Uh, Vertipack really excels in vertical aggregations, but performs much worse on a detailed uh, level of reporting. With that in mind, if you have, let's say, a table with 20,000 rows and some measures being calculated for each row, you should be better off keeping this high level detail by taking advantage of drill through feature. Uh, so display aggregated data in the table by default and then give user a possibility to drill through to specific row if necessary. If you have a lot of visuals on the page and don't necessarily need mutual interactions between them, such as cross-filtering, you should simply disable that option. Also, sometimes sync slicers option can be performance killer. Uh, if you have multiple slicers on multiple report pages and you choose to synchronize all of them, make sure that it's not the reason for your report's poor performance. Well, maybe I should place this scene in the beginning as a decision which storage mode to use is one of the first you need to make when starting your Power BI solution. Uh, however, I've intentionally left it for the closing part of the session and I've had a good reason for doing this. I saw a lot of cases, believe me, when someone thought that poor report performance can be improved by switching to a direct query mode and leveraging capabilities of uh, robust database management systems that are built to efficiently cope with large amounts of data. Oh, how wrong is that assumption? I mean, those systems are built to cope with large amounts of data in most efficient way, but in completely different scenarios. Before I explain why you should avoid using direct query, let me first explain what is a direct query at all. When you choose direct query storage mode for your table, uh, this means that the data is being retrieved from the data source at the query time. And this also means that the data resides in its original data source before, during and after the query execution. Thinking that using direct query mode will improve your Power BI report performance is one of the biggest fallacies. Uh, direct query will never ever improve performance of your Power BI report. Keep that in mind. So to cut the story short, you should use direct query literally in three and only three scenarios. First one, your data size is so large that you simply can't import it in Power BI. Uh, when I say so large, too large, for pro licenses, this limit is one gigabyte per data set. For premium, this should not be an issue at all. Uh, requirement to have a near real-time reporting solution. As we've already learned, when you use import mode, Power BI keeps the snapshot of your data in memory. Now, let's say that the requirement is to have the data with maximum one minute latency. Obviously, you can't refresh data so frequently to satisfy this request. However, be careful this and don't fall into the trap if your users request uh, real-time data. Uh, in most cases, they are not aware about the possible downsides, so explain them all the uh, caveats and downsides of using direct query mode. And from my experience, in 99% of cases, users will admit and agree that maybe they don't really need real-time data. Finally, security policies. When security policies are defined on the data source size, uh, as report consumers credentials will be propagated to the underlying data source and security rules will be applied there, it makes sense to use direct query. If I still didn't convince you to avoid direct query or you simply must go this way, uh, here is the list of general rules that you should keep in mind uh, in order to get the maximum performance from direct query storage mode. Uh, the first one is huge if. So if you have permissions to perform changes on the data source, there are multiple ways to improve the direct query performance. First, you can create proper indexes to support your most frequently run queries. Also, you should ensure that data integrity is in place. And finally, if possible, 
create a persistent data object in the database such as tables or even better materialized or indexed views uh, which will persist all the necessary transformations and calculations. On the other hand, if you don't have access to an underlying database, you can still gain some improvements within Power BI itself. The most important thing is avoid complex query, uh, complex Power Query transformations as the SQL that is being generated by the Meshup engine, as you already saw in one of the previous demos, is not always the most optimal one. It is correct SQL, but often is not the optimal one. Uh, if you need to use calculated columns, try to push their creation on the source database and keep them persistent. Also avoid writing complex DAX measures, as your DAX statement in the end needs to be translated to SQL. Keep in mind that this process can produce sometimes expensive SQL queries. Again, whenever possible, perform all your calculations on the source side. Next, avoid relationships on GUID columns. So what are GUIDs? Uh, that's a specific data type, unique identifier. Power BI doesn't support this data type and needs to apply some internal data conversion uh, during the query execution, which affects the performance. The solution here is to convert this data type within the source database before Power BI generates its own queries. Limit parallelism whenever possible. You can define the maximum number of connections that Direct Query can open at the same time. How do you do this? Let me show you in Power BI Desktop. So if I go to Options and Settings, Options, and if I go to Current File and uh, Publish Dataset Settings, here by default you can see that maximum connections per data source are 10, so you can reduce uh, the number if necessary. So you can, you can adjust uh, the maximum number of connections per data source. Uh, there are also some, sorry I forgot to show you, there are also some additional uh, optimization options in the query reduction tab. So let me show you. Here under query reduction tab you can uh, for example add apply button for each slicer to apply changes when, you are, when they are ready. So uh, by default, when you change one slicer value, all the slicers will generate the separate query to a data source, even those which haven't changed. That also can improve performance if you uh, add a button, but then that raises some questions uh, for uh, proper design on the report canvas. Okay, going back to my PowerPoint, uh, you should also check assume referential integrity option. Uh, that will enable the usage of inner joins instead of outer joins, which are in theory, or at least it should be uh, most ef uh, more efficient than, so inner joins are more efficient than outer joins uh, on the underlying SQL database. Of course, as a prerequisite, you should have referential integrity in place within your source database. How do you check this option? Again, let's go to Power BI Desktop. If I go to Model tab and if I click on this relationship between my tables, here, Assume Referential Integrity. Now, this option is disabled in our case because we are using import mode, but uh, if my tables were in, uh, in, in direct query mode, this option could be uh, checked here and that will uh, probably produce uh, inner joins on the underlying table. Okay, again going back to PowerPoint. To conclude, the best practice regarding direct query storage mode is avoid direct query whenever possible and if possible. Hook we covered a lot and this talk is probably more suitable for at least 90 minute session duration as each of those subtopics can be a session on its own. But let's wrap up the key takeaways from our today's session and I call this Monday to-do list. So when you go to, to uh, your office on Monday, this is the list uh, that you should apply to your Power BI solutions in order to improve the performance. First, the key thing is to identify which part or which parts of your Power BI solution don't perform well. If your data model size is large, 
consider removing unnecessary rows and columns and try to reduce column cardinality, for example, by removing time portion from your time step columns as you saw in our example. If your data refresh process takes a while, check if the query folding is in place. In case that you identify the step that breaks query folding and you need to keep it in your transformations in your transformation pipeline, try to push it down the, this transformation pipeline as much as possible. Be mindful when you write DAX to enhance your data model with additional columns and measures. For example, if you need to filter the data, always filter columns, not whole tables. Also use iterator functions carefully as they will apply the calculation row by row and this can affect uh, performance for large uh, tables. If your report page renders slowly, try to reduce the number of visuals on it. Uh, take advantage of using performance analyzer to identify bottlenecks and don't use many visuals that calculate single value, such as card visuals, for example. Finally, stay away from direct query storage mode if possible and use it in only those three scenarios we've already discussed. Now, you should keep in mind each of these points, of course, but if you ask me, one of them is slightly more significant and that is, that is the number one. Uh, identifying which part of your Power BI solution is the root of the performance issues uh, will help you to focus on solving a specific problem rather than wasting time on less important stuff. Okay, so let, that's it for me. You know what they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So now that you know uh, what are the deadly sins when it comes to Power BI performance, you may get your redemption by avoiding committing them again. Special thanks goes to Microsoft for supporting Data Platform Geeks and SQL Server Geeks community initiatives. And of course, uh, again, huge shout out to Amit and Data Platform Summit team for putting their time and effort in organizing such a great event. You can also win some cool prizes and there are multiple ways to get involved, as you can see on your screen. So post your selfie, give session and conference feedback. That would be much appreciated also by as speakers and visit sponsors and exhibitors places. Stay safe, have a great day and enjoy the rest of Data Platform Summit. See you!